They did it. NASA reached out and touched the sun. I'm Tanya Hall and joining me is Dr. Nikki Fox, Director of the Heliophysics Division Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. Welcome Nikki and congratulations on this important milestone. Thank you. Parker Solar Probe launched from Cape Canaveral in August of 2018. Start off by reminding us how you're involved with the Parker Solar Probe mission and uh, what it is. So back in August of 2018, I was uh, at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab where I was the project scientist for, for the mission. And so, you know, everything was exciting and we were getting ready to, to launch and we were, had all these amazing questions that we were looking forward to answering. Um, as you noted, we launched in August of last year. And just actually three weeks after that, I moved uh, just a little bit south down to uh, NASA's headquarters where I became the division director for uh, the heliophysics division. And so heliophysics really studies everything that the sun touches. It's a, I like to say, it's like the Lion King. I control everything the light touches. And so um, we, we look at everything that the sun, all of the influences it has as the, the outer atmosphere, what we call the solar wind, continually streams away from the sun and bathes all of the planets. Here on Earth, we actually live in that solar wind, and so we really feel the effect of everything that comes from the sun. So the heliophysics division has spacecraft in key locations, really studying what is happening on the sun and how it affects us here on Earth. The key role that Parker Solar Probe plays is for the very first time going into the atmosphere of our star and measuring all of the excitement and all of the, the telling us what what the mysteries are that are in that corona for the very first time. The Parker team made their first announcement of results from the mission, and uh, you began the announcement by stating why this mission is so important to all of us on Earth. And as you started talking about, summar summarize why this mission is so important. So it's the first time that we've ever been into the atmosphere of a star. I mean, that, that to me is just amazing without any of the impacts that we feel here on Earth, but actually going into the atmosphere of a star. And it's the only star that we can visit right now. I mean, obviously we all have plans and we'd love to go to visit other stars, but, but right now it's the only one that we can go up close and go into the atmosphere. And even then it took us 60 years to mature the technology to be able to make this mission happen. It's not an easy place to go. You know, NASA has sent incredible missions to every other key location in our solar system. System. And the last one is really the most important, and it's the inner corona. It's that, that hazy atmosphere that we see during a total solar eclipse. Parker Solar Probe is in that sort of atmosphere of our star. And so as that, as that atmosphere, um, it's superheated. It's about 300 times hotter than the surface of the sun, which is mystery number one. And then also in this region where we see this heating, it gets accelerated and it can break away from the giant pole of the sun and actually go out all the way to the very edge of our solar system. And so it really shapes our place in the, in the, you know, the galactic neighborhood. So as, as the whole solar system is, uh, is revolving and moving around on its journey around the Milky Way, we are protected kind of from the vagaries of interstellar space by our solar wind. It actually creates and carves out this sort of bubble for us and our whole solar system lives in this bubble. So the, the sun is, is important to us for so many reasons. We could talk for hours about all the discoveries, but let's zero in on a couple of the surprises. Which strikes the team as most significant? So we announced four uh, big sort of uh, paper, there were four big papers today. Each of them were really focused on one of the key instrument suites. Parker Solar Probe carries four instrument suites. Um, I think the one that, that we're all very excited about is, is we think we have a smoking gun for why um, we see this heating and acceleration in the solar wind. And so we've known that the, the corona itself was superheated and much, much hotter than the surface of the sun for over 100 years, 150 years. Um, but we've, we've never found a theory that can predict why it's always like that. You know, you can think, well, if you put energy in, then it would happen for a short time. But my goodness, you have to keep that energy going and you keep the, uh, the solar wind being accelerated. So how do you keep doing that? And there's never been a theory, one single theory that could really tell us how we did that. 
So one of the things that we discovered is what we're calling switchbacks in the magnetic field. Now, by the time the field, you imagine the solar wind is flowing away from the sun and it's carrying with it the sun's magnetic field. So you would expect to see the magnetic field always sort of coming towards you, at least in that in the same direction, even though it might wiggle around in other ways, it's coming straight towards you. What we see are these sort of S shape or switchbacks. And you can see it in this video of, of the way it's sort of kinking back on itself. And if you think of those magnetic field lines, a bit like a kind of a rubber rope or something, you know, you, it's hard to, to put that energy in to, to make it kink. But as soon as you let it go, it's going to spring apart and that energy is going to come out a bit like a whip crack. When you hear that sound, that is energy being released and the whip makes that sort of S shape as you whip it out. <clears throat> um, if you also think of stretching a, a rubber band until it breaks and you feel pain from the breaking of the, of the rubber band, it's actually the heat. So you put all that energy into the rubber band as you stretch it, and as it breaks, it puts heat into your fingers. So the energy you put in is now repaid to you in a little bit of pain on the end of your fingers. And so we think that this energy is actually being released when these, these S-shaped curves are kind of relaxing. And so now we know that there's mechanisms that are putting energy into the solar wind. They can cause acceleration and it can cause heating. We never saw this outside the, um, the orbit of Mercury. And so you've, you know, we've looked at the sun in all these different wavelengths up until now, and uh, we've sent the spacecraft in as far as Mercury. But by the time everything gets there, these S shapes have disappeared, these switchbacks are no longer there. And so as we've got closer and closer, we've seen more and more of these features. Um, so we think as the orbit gets smaller and smaller, as you know, we go through our seven years, that we're going to see yet more of these, probably bigger in amplitude, bigger in energy, and probably happening a lot more often. And so there's definitely a smoking gun now. Now what we want to do, of course, is, is link those, those switchbacks to features on the surface of the sun. Because once we can say, hey, that particular feature there is sending out these, these, these unusual waves and these sort of um, like parcels of energy, dumping it into to the, the magnetic field, causing this sort of S shape and then releasing it. And so what we want to do now is to be able to go back to the surface of the sun and find where these, these little S shapes are coming from. And then that will help us be able to better predict when we're gonna see larger events coming from the sun. So that's just one of, of our results. I guess the other one I'll highlight just because it makes me laugh is um, I, I once had a conversation with our, our Whisper PI. So that is the principal investigator of, of the white light imager that we fly on Parker Solar Probe. And he was telling me that back in 1929, uh, it was first um, predicted that there would be a dust free region close to the sun. So the, the solar system is very dusty. Um, lots of impacts of, of, uh, of asteroids and of uh, comets. And you know when they sort of break up, they actually leave dust around. And so this dust, it collides with one another, it gets smaller and smaller until we get this very fine dust that's close to the sun. And so I said to him, you know, so, so how are we gonna prove this? Because obviously we can't see it from here at Earth because we're looking through the dust. And so he said, well, we'll get close enough that the Whisper camera should, should actually see a dust-free region. And I said, so you're telling me our biggest result is going to be seeing absolutely nothing at all. <laughs> and it, indeed, it is. And so as we're getting closer and closer, we're seeing the dust environment starting to, to really decrease. And it's decreasing in, in quite a, a, an orderly fashion. And so we think, you know, we haven't quite got to the dust-free region, but we're seeing a big decrease in the amount of dust. And so as we get closer, the, uh, the whisper field of view will indeed get close enough to the sun that it should be able to see a totally clean region with no dust. And so we've already started to see uh, the beginnings of, of that. And then I think the last uh, result I would highlight is just um, seeing some incredible structure in the energetic particles. And so we carry all these different instrument suites so we can look at everything in the solar wind. Um, so we, you know, we've talked about the field uh, kind of kinking back on itself. We also added the plasma measurements. So the sort of the bulk, um, what is flowing continually from the sun in the solar wind that helped us to know that the field was really reversing and it wasn't just a different field line that happened to be pointing in the other way. And then of course we carry a particle suite that is looking at very high energy particles, things that are associated with transients in the solar wind, flares, 
CMEs. We see big particle events. These are events that, that um, energize particles so much that they accelerate them to almost the speed of light. These guys are, you know, they're nasty. If you're an astronaut, you want to know these things are coming. Um, now we're in really close. We're seeing tiny particle events that we could not see from out um, anywhere near, you know, even in as far as Mercury. And so we're now seeing a lot of structure and a lot of these tiny events. If you put a lot of tiny events together, they will actually merge into kind of a bow wave. And so we're now starting to see almost the birth of these really big, strong, energetic particle events. Um, so I said I was going to do one. I did them all. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Um, you've mentioned several times that we're, we're expecting to get more information and, and more data. In fact, this is just the beginning for Parker. The mission timeline calls for many more excursions into the sun through 2025, I think yes. it is. Th this timeline allows for observations during the solar minimum and towards the solar maximum. What opportunities does that present? Actually, that's one of the beautiful things about Parker Solar Probe. Um, we launched at solar minimum. So right now we have a, a fairly inactive sun, which is actually, we say it's inactive, but we've seen all this incredible stuff. So imagine what it'll be like when it gets active. Um, but we... Um, it really allows us to look at all different types of solar wind. And so we know that some solar wind is associated with coronal holes and they're normally seen around the poles of the sun, but we're seeing them down um, towards much, much lower latitudes on the sun than we would expect. We've seen solar wind emanating from those coronal holes already um, just in our first three orbits. As the sun gets more active, we'll see a lot more active regions, a lot more sunspots starting to appear, and we'll see different kinds of solar wind. And so having that seven-year mission means that um, we will go uh, a full sort of solar, we won't go the full solar cycle, but we'll go the full um, range of solar activity from minimum up to maximum. And also by having these um, successive Venus flybys. So we have another six to go. The next one is actually December 26th. So it's a bit of a Christmas present for me is the next Venus flyby. And then um, that will take us to a new orbit. And so instead of being, we're around 15.8 million miles away from the sun at our closest approach right now, after that next Venus flyby, we'll be about 12 million miles. So a big jump in for us and um, a whole new solar wind for us to be uh, studying. So uh, Parker Solar Probe is just a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Dr. Eugene Parker, the astrophysicist who, after which the probe is named, is in his 90s now. So what is his reaction to the mission's progress? Oh, he is amazing. Um, he is clearly uh, so involved and so excited um, by the, the, the mission and by the results. I actually had a, uh, the pleasure of going to visit him for Parker Solar Probe's first birthday on orbit. I actually went out to visit him and uh, showed him um, a lot of the sneak peeks of some of the data. And, you know, he just sort of said, golly, that's totally unexpected. Yeah, I thought we'd see something unexpected. <laughs> and um, He's, he's been interacting with a lot of the principal investigators and the key scientists and, and really enjoying seeing all of their, their results. And uh, you know, he's, he's uh, anxious and awaiting our great results as they come out. So uh, he's very, very involved, still very emotional about saying goodbye to the spacecraft. Um, he said, you know, it was, you're sending, sending her bravely off into this region of, of the unknown and she's not coming back. And uh, he wiped away a tear. So it's very sweet. All right, Nikki, where can where can the public find the information you presented at the announcement today? Uh, so all of the information is on our website at nasa.gov. Uh, you can uh, you can certainly Google Parker Solar Probe, and all this will come up for you. Um, and you can also follow us on Twitter at NASA Sun, and on Facebook also at NASA Sun. Um, and so uh, please follow us, follow the journey of Parker Solar Probe, um, and, uh, and we'd, we'd love to share our results with us. This is really only the beginning, the first four papers, but we have a lot more science and a lot more science results to come. It's just going to get more interesting, Nikki. Thanks so much for joining us. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.